Welcome back. Today we'll be discussing chapter 16, which is general pharmacology. Once again, this is a chapter that has a lot of practical aspects to it. In class, we played with a lot of the different medications that we're going to be talking about, show how to set a lot of these up. So if at any point you feel the need to go over these medications, again, feel free to reach out to me and we will go through them hands on. So we'll be discussing medications that we give as EMTs. We're also going to talk a lot about general information about medications, <clears throat> general pharmacology terms, and some things that we need to know. Uh, we'll touch briefly on medications that patients take at home themselves, and then we'll wrap up with doing some ALS assisting skills. I'm talking about IVs and stuff like that. So as an EMT, you'll be able to give the following medications on the ambulance. Aspirin, oral glucose, oxygen, albuterol, epinephrine, naloxone, and you can assist people with their nitroglycerin. There are a lot of other medications that are carried on the ambulance. A lot of those are meant for ALS providers. So just be aware that there are a lot more medications there that when you go to pick a medication out, you're going to have to sift through a lot of different medications to find the one that you want. So that's where it becomes vitally important that you actually know what these things look like and um, all the different functions. And it's also important that you become familiar with your equipment as well as some of the other ALS stuff that you might have to assist your paramedic with. So as a general rule of thumb, if you are doing something to a patient, you should know everything there is to know about what you're doing to that patient. And that becomes even more important with pharmacology. If you are putting something inside of the patient that is going to do something inside the patient, you should know everything inside and outside about what you're actually doing to that patient, what you're actually putting into that patient. So it's your responsibility to know several things, such as what the drug is supposed to do inside the body, the intended effects the drug has, which is why we are giving it, the side effects that a drug might carry with it so that you can warn the patient, and then if the side effects happen, you know that it's attributed to the drug, what the indications, which means the things that tell us when to do something, and then the contraindications, which is things that tell us when not to do something, are for the, giving the drug. And if you have negative effects from the drug, how can we how we can treat those? So some terms that you're going to have to be familiar with when we're talking about these drugs. First is the drug class. So a drug class is an overwhelming kind of umbrella of a bunch of drugs do this in the body. So it belongs under this drug class. An uh, example of this would be uh, pain medication um, such as morphine or fentanyl. Morphine or fentanyl fall under the umbrella of the opiate drug class, which is something I'm sure that you've heard um, mentioned before is opiates. Uh, the second thing that you have to be aware of is the mechanism of action. So this is what actually is occurring in the body. This is what the drug is designed to do inside the body. So those are two things that you have to be very aware of when we're talking about drugs, just to give you a better idea of what is going to happen when we give these drugs, which will help you remember when we should and shouldn't give these types of drugs. So a term that you might hear thrown out around a lot in EMS is rights of drugs. Some people might say five rights. In fact, your textbook actually says five rights. Some people say seven rights. Some people say eight rights. I generally stick to about six rights. So there are a few other ones you might hear thrown around um, every now and then. Just remember that most of them contain at least these six. So first one is the right patient. So is this the correct patient that we're giving the medication to? This is more so an effect for like hospitals where you have multiple patients you're taking care of at once. But if you have a mass casualty incident where you have more than one patient, make sure you're giving the drug to the correct patient. So correct name of the patient. And then also make sure that the indications are correct for the patient. Make sure this is the right patient that needs this drug. Second is right time. So this especially comes into play if you're administering uh, multiple doses of a drug. Uh, for example, nitroglycerin, you can only administer once every five minutes. So make sure it's the right time to administer a medication. Make sure it's the actual right medication in your hand. 
uh, confirm that this is the medication that you selected and that it's in date. Next is the right dose. Make sure that you're not overdosing or underdosing your patient. Next, the right route. There's a lot of different routes that we can administer medication through, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the chapter. So make sure that you're administering it correctly. And then lastly is the right documentation. As with any intervention, we want to make sure that we document everything that we do. So make sure that you document what drug you gave, what dose you gave, and at what time you gave it, and then the effects that the drug had. And that's all stuff that we talk about during communication and documentation. So whenever you give a drug, you should verify these six rights every single time. It's really usually done very quickly um, in your head, but there are things that you need to keep in mind any time that you give a drug. <clears throat> keep in mind that a lot of the medications that we carry and a lot of medications that we give may have already been prescribed to the patient. So that becomes important, we'll talk about it a little bit later as well, where you need to find out, has the patient already taken this medication? So some of the ones that are very common that patients carry, uh, albuterol, people have inhalers. So find out, has the patient been using their inhaler? What's been the effect of them using their inhaler? How many times have they used the inhaler? Another one is nitroglycerin. This is very important because for us as EMTs to actually give nitroglycerin, the patient has to be prescribed it. And then another very common one are EpiPens, which uh, if someone has an EpiPen there's, and they're having an allergic reaction, there's a good chance that they may have already taken it. So you need to evaluate if it was effective or not because we really need to think twice before giving them multiple doses of epinephrine. All right, so all that being said, let's dive into our actual medications that we give. We're going to do all of them today. And then when we talk about specific emergencies where we're going to be using these medications, we're going to come back and talk about them again. But we need to have a good base of pharmacology knowledge first. So this isn't the only time you're going to be seeing this material, but it is important that we retain it now. So that being said, first one we're going to discuss today is albuterol. So the drug class that albuterol falls under, they're called sympathomimetics. So if we break that word down, we have sympatho and then mimetic. Mimetic means copying, think mimic someone. So it's copies something in the body. And the sympatho is um, abbreviating the sympathetic nervous system. I know that we touched on this very briefly in anatomy and physiology. But we have two different nervous systems in our body. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight. That's the thing that gets your body all amped up. So if you think about your fight or flight response, uh, it increases your heart rate. It increases or dilates your bronchioles to make you breathe better. It will uh, quench or vasoconstrict your vasculature. So it, um, clenches down all your vasculature to raise your blood pressure up. It's everything that we would need for a fight or to run. So that is your sympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic ner nervous system does the exact opposite. So that brings everything back down. It, we call it your feed or breed response. So it will um, make everything in your GI system more active. It's going to lower your blood pressure because it vasodilates. It's going to lower your heart rate. It's going to uh, make your bronchioles not as dilated. So it brings everything back down in the body. So sympathetic brings everything up. Your parasympathetic brings everything down. So all that being said, albuterol being a sympathomimetic means that it mimics your sympathetic nervous system. So if we think about that, and that's the drug class that it's in, we now know that it's going to mimic everything for fight or flight. So keeping that in mind, it's going to be a lot easier to remember what the drug does and some side effects that it might have. <clears throat> the, uh, the second drug class that it belongs to is it's a bronchodilator. So that is part of the sympathomimetic drugs. Uh, some focus on being a bronchodilator. And that just means that it dilates your bronchioles. That is our intended effect with albuterol. That's why we're giving it. We give it for um, asthmatics and uh, COPD patients, which we'll talk about in respiratory emergencies. And the idea there is we have constricted bronchioles 
and we're giving this to dilate them so that we can breathe better. The dose that we give albuterol in is 2.5 milligrams, and it's mixed in three milliliters of normal saline. We also give this uh, as a nebulized medication. So we have to put it into a nebulizer and shoot oxygen through the nebulizer to make it into a vapor substance that you can breathe in. So again, this is a lot easier to show in person. <laughs> So just keep in mind that this is a nebulized medication. And whenever we use a nebulizer, we have to set the range of oxygen for liters per minute between six and eight. If you go less than six, you don't have enough force to properly vaporize the uh, liquid. So the albuterol won't be vaporized properly to be breathed in. If you go above eight, you're pushing so much that's going to burn off um, way too much of it. So it's not actually getting into our body. It's just kind of being um, shot into the atmosphere. So that's why we want to keep it between six and eight. Me personally, I give it um, at a rate of six. That's just my personal preference. And most people that I know of also follow that. Uh, as far as our protocol as EMTs, you can give albuterol up to three times on standing order. If you need to give it more than three times, that's when we have to contact medical control and ask for an order for additional albuterol past the three administrations that we do. In terms of time of re-administering medication, as soon as the first nebulizer is done, so no more vapor is being pushed out because it's all been burned up, we can immediately give another or another treatment. So they go back to back to back if needed. So the indications, remember indication is something that tells you that you should do this. So indications for albuterol, we're looking for difficulty breathing, specifically difficulty breathing that has wheezing for lung sounds. That being said, wheezing is not a end all be all. You know, if you aren't wheezing, you can't give albuterol. It's just something we see in the vast majority of our patients. So if you don't have wheezing, also look for their history. So if they have a history of asthma or COPD and they are having significant respiratory stress and you don't hear any air movement, just because you don't hear a wheeze doesn't mean that they're not having an asthma attack that will not be helped by the albuterol. If they're not moving any air whatsoever, you probably won't hear the wheeze at all, but they still absolutely need the albuterol. Keep in mind, that's the exception, not the rule. Typically, um, you're going to find wheezing for your lung sounds, and that will be a strong indication that you need to give albuterol. Your contraindications for albuterol, we don't have too many. Uh, you have an if you have an allergy to albuterol, which is very, very rare to have that. And then have a second thought if you have someone with significant tachycardia. Notice it says precaution, not contraindication. So tachycardia is not a hard and fast, you can't give this if the person has this condition, which that's usually what contraindication means. A precaution just means think twice about doing this. The reason for that is if you think back to our drug class for albuterol, it's a sympathomimetic, and part of the sympathetic nervous system response is it will raise your heart rate. So if you already have someone who has a very, very fast heart rate, this medication is going to raise it even further. So that's why we have to think twice if we have someone with a very high heart rate, because we don't want to make the tachycardia even worse. And that becomes a judgment call. It's You have to look at how the patient's breathing and see, you know, do you have to rob Pierre to pay Paul? Uh, you know, yes, it's going to be bad for the person's heart rate to go from 140 to 150, but we need to open up their airway. And typically, if you open up their airway, the heart rate's actually going to start to come down because your heart no longer has to compensate for the lack of perfusion that's happening. So things to keep in mind, generally, if they really need albuterol, if they're having difficulty breathing, it's okay to have the side effect of the heart rate going up a little bit. Again, with tachycardia, you want to reassess the patient's heart rate after every administration because we know that albuterol is going to be uh, bringing the heart rate up a little bit. So make sure that their heart hasn't jacked up too far before you give another administration of albuterol. Also, be very aware that albuterol is not the only medication that we carry on the ambulance that looks like albuterol. Uh, it's carried in a clear plastic container that 
the writing is in clear plastic on it, so it's very hard to read, and it's usually very, very small writing. And there's three different medications that look very identical. They are packaged exactly the same, just have different small writing on them. Uh, one is a dual neb, then one is a medication called atrovent or ipratrapium bromide. Neither one of these you at the EMT level can administer. So be aware that they exist in the ambulance and they're oftentimes kept right next to or even together with albuterol in the same compartment. So be sure that you actually read what you're giving. This is where knowing that's the right drug becomes vitally important because there's just very little writing that will just say albuterol or A versus ipratropium bromide or I on it. And that's something that we can show in person of the different writings between them. Just be very aware that you're actually giving the correct medication, especially with albuterol. Another thing to think about, uh, because it's a sympathomimetic, sympathomimetic is meant to jack you your body up. So a side effect is the patient might feel very anxious and jittery because they, their body is revved up for a fight or flight response. So know that a patient might get anxious when we give them this medication and patients are usually pretty anxious when they feel like they can't breathe to begin with so you kind of have anxiety coupled with i'm um, giving something that's going to give you more anxiety so a lot of patients will ask is this normal that i'm twitching i'm jittering and i can't feel feel like i have good control over my fingertips those are all normal side effects to the drug and like i said it's imperative that we know when we're putting a medication inside someone's body we need to know the side effects that happen so that we can predict them and we can explain them to our patients. Because our patients, especially if they've ever had albuterol before, might not know that this is a normal response and they might freak out thinking that they're dying because they've never felt this way before. So moving on into nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin is a very potent medication. It comes in several different forms. Uh, this picture that I, I'm showing you right now is the spray version. There's also a paste version that uh, EMT basics are not allowed to give. And there's also a tab version that most patients have the tab version. That's what most ambulance services carry are the tab version. So it is a very potent, very dangerous medication. That's why protocols have actually recently changed so that EMT basics can only give nitroglycerin to people who already have this prescribed to them. So if they do not have nitroglycerin prescribed, you are not allowed to administer it. So we call this assisting with the patient's nitroglycerin administration because you are assisting with something that they already have prescribed. So the drug class of nitroglycerin is it is a vasodilator. So breaking that word down, it dilates your vasculature, makes your vasculature bigger. Uh, we administer nitroglycerin sublingually. So sub is below, think of a submarine, and lingually, if you remember your a &P, is your tongue. So we place the tab or we give the spray underneath the tongue so the patient actually has to lift the tongue up. We'll put the tab tablet um, right between their tongue and their jaw, and we have them put their tongue on top of it and we let it dissolve. The dose that we give uh, patients is point, or 0 0.4 milligrams. That is what one tab or one spray equals. You might hear people refer to nitroglycerin as 400 micrograms. 400 micrograms or MCG is the same as 0 0.4 milligrams. So there are a thousand micrograms to one milligram. So that's why people might say that at some point. Uh, most people say 0.4 milligrams um, when they're talking about nitroglycerin, but you might hear a provider to refer to it in the microgram version. Just be aware that that might happen. One hard and fast rule is that the patient must have a systolic blood pressure over 120. And we'll talk about that in the next slide as to why that's very important. But that is a hard and fast. If their blood pressure is below 120, we are not administering this medication. As far as repeating doses, you can repeat it every five minutes until the symptoms subside. The symptoms we're looking for is chest pain when we're giving nitroglycerin. Or if the administration becomes contraindicated because the blood pressure goes below 120. 
So that means you have to reassess the blood pressure every five minutes before you give another dose of nitroglycerin. So this is something where we are heavily monitoring our patient to make sure that they're okay. So, like I said, it's a very potent drug, so we really need to be aware of the side effects of nitroglycerin. So, it being a vasodilator and it working across the entire body, if we take the vasculature and we open it up, we in turn are going to lower our blood pressure because you make the tank a whole lot bigger. And if you make the tank a whole lot bigger and you don't change the amount of fluid that's in that tank, you're going to have a lot less pressure inside that tank. So, one thing that we're very concerned of is dropping the blood pressure too much. If you end up giving nitroglycerin to a patient and their blood pressure goes down significantly, we do actually have a treatment that we can do that will pretty effectively uh, bring their blood pressure back to somewhat normal. And that's actually laying the patient down flat. So putting the patient supine is one of the primary ways that we can help the blood pressure stabilize from nitroglycerin administration. So keep that in mind. If you have hypotension from nitroglycerin administration, lay the patient flat and that should help restore the blood pressure a little bit. It's probably not gonna bring it back up all the way, but it is our primary treatment. In turn, a very, very, very big side effect that a lot of patients will feel is they'll get a splitting headache when you give nitroglycerin. This is caused by the rapid drop in blood pressure. If you have a rapid drop in blood pressure, your brain doesn't get perfused as well, and it's going to start giving you pain because if it notices any drop in perfusion, you get pain, just like your heart. If your heart's not perfused well, 
you get pain there. It's a sign saying, hey, something just changed, something's wrong. You also de decrease your preload in your heart. So if you remember back to anatomy and physiology and talking about the heart, we have uh, that term called preload. That is the amount of blood that's actually coming into our atrium during the relaxation phase. That's the part that fills our atrium before it contracts to our ventricles. So with giving a vasodilator, you aren't going to have as much pressure to push that blood into the heart, which is going to lower your preload. And if this is why nitroglycerin becomes very dangerous, because if the heart's already not pumping well, because it's dying on the inside, because you can't get enough blood to the coronary arteries. If we already take that heart that's struggling to effectively pump, then we say, oh, we aren't going to give you as much blood in your preload to be ready to pump, then your heart won't be able to pump effectively at all. So it's kind of a multiplying effect, which will drastically, drastically drop the blood pressure. So that's why we really have to be careful to make sure blood pressure is okay before we give nitroglycerin because if blood pressure is not okay and then we decrease the preload of the heart, not only is the heart not getting enough blood out initially, it's not getting enough blood back in. So again, we have a multiplying effect which will be devastating to the patient and can actually kill the patient. So some precautions. Notice I didn't say contraindications but precautions for giving nitroglycerin. One is a patient who has taken erectile dysfunction medication in the past 72 hours. That used to be a hard and fast contraindication. It is now more of a precaution. The reason why is erectile dysfunction medications are vasodilators. So if someone has already taken erectile dysfunction medication, they, they already have a very long lasting vasodilator in their system. So we don't want to combine nitro, nitroglycerin with another vasodilator and have a multiplying effect on the body. Like I said, that's no longer a hard and fast contraindication. It's just something to keep in mind. So keep in mind that the patient might have a more acute drop of blood pressure if they're already on a, another vasodilator. So if their blood pressure is 122 systolic, and they're on a erectile dysfunction medication, say Viagra or Cialis, think twice about actually giving the medication. I probably wouldn't at that point because I don't want to risk the blood pressure dropping significantly. If their blood pressure is 200 systolic and they're on Cialis, or Viagra, or any other erectile dysfunction medication, then it's probably more safe because they can come down a significant amount for, on their blood pressure without actually being in trouble. So that's why it's a precaution now. It's not a hard and fast, you can't do it. It's just a, hey, think twice before we do this. Look at the whole patient picture before we do this. Also, um, touching with erectile dysfunction medication, there are some females who are prescribed erectile dysfunction medication. Uh, that's because since it's a vasodilator, it lowers the blood pressure. Some females who have blood pressure issues are prescribed this for their blood pressure. So just because you have a female patient doesn't mean that you can ignore asking them, have they taken any erectile dysfunction medication in the past 72 hours? So just keep that in mind. It's not just exclusively a question for males. Another precaution is a known adverse response to the medication. Notice I didn't say allergy. It's really hard to have a allergy to nitroglycerin, but if you have someone who says, oh, I've been given nitroglycerin in the past and it dropped my blood pressure 100 points and their blood pressure is 130. Yes, can you theoretically give the medication under standard orders? Sure. But if they've already had a history of dropping significantly, do you really want to run the risk of their blood pressure dropping that significantly if it's at 130 already? So just think twice. Again, take the whole patient picture into account. I've said it several times before in this class. I'm going to say it several times more. A lot of medicine is gray. It's not black and white rules. Take a whole look at your patient picture. That's why we teach you all the different aspects of the human body and patients, because we need to look at the patient as a whole, not just a 
subset black and white rule like giving nitroglycerin. So take a good look at your overall patient picture. So some side notes, when you give nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin can very easily be absorbed through the skin. Uh, at the start of talking about nitroglycerin, I talked about nitroglycerin paste. That's a paste that we put on the patient's skin and it'll absorb through the skin. Any other form can also be absorbed through the skin. When we give it sublingually, we are putting it in the mouth where it's wet and will dissolve quickly, but it is being put into the body through skin contact. So when we administer nitroglycerin, we cannot have that tablet touch our skin or otherwise it's going to start absorbing into us. So be very aware of that when you're administering nitroglycerin. If you have the tab form, use gloves. <laughs> um, so you can put the nitroglycerin on your gloved hand and then administer it to the patient. Don't be using bare skin um, and bare hands to be given this medication. If you use the spray, make sure you aren't spraying it around in the atmosphere. That's actually something that when I first started in EMS, I would do because uh, a lot of times the spray isn't primed when you are going to give it to the patient. So you would push down and there will only be half a spray that would come out, which you want a full spray to come out. So I would always push or put it over to the side, just spray a couple times until it's fully primed and I was getting full sprays out, then I administer it to the patient. Me being new and not experienced, I started to turn towards the AC vents in the ambulance. I would spray that way, and then the AC vents would blow it straight back in my face. And then I'd wonder why I was getting a splitting headache every single time that I was giving nitroglycerin. That's because the nitro was being blown into my face. I was breathing it in. So I was inadvertently giving myself nitroglycerin doses. So just be very aware of the fact that that can very easily be absorbed by us. So be very careful when you're giving nitroglycerin for your own personal safety. Also, uh, again, I've mentioned it several times in New York State, the patient has to be prescribed the nitroglycerin. That being said, can we give them our nitroglycerin that we carry on the ambulance, or do we have to use their own vial? So the textbook answer would be to say, look, use their own vial because you're assisting with their medication. But if they've taken four or five before you got there and they say it's not working, that hasn't changed their pain, and then you look and you see that their nitroglycerin expired a year ago, they don't usually take it because they don't usually get chest pain, then use the, the fresh good stuff that you have on your ambulance. It's the exact same medication, just given to the agency at a different time than it was given to the patient, but it's not going to harm the patient because it came off our ambulance versus theirs. And we know that the one on our ambulance is fresh and effective because we're giving nitroglycerin a whole lot more than a lot of our patients give themselves nitroglycerin. So keep that in mind. If they've used their own and it's not being effective, take a look to see if it's been expired or any other signs that it may be compromised. Nitroglycerin is a medication that's very susceptible to sunlight, which a lot comes in a brown vial so sunlight can't get through it very well but if the patient keeps it on their windowsill with the rest of their medications and is exposed to direct sunlight every day for six months then it might not be effective anymore so know that theirs might be compromised somehow and so the one on the ambulance might be a little bit more effective especially if they've already taken theirs with no relief and you think this is this is something that should relieve their pain Moving on into epinephrine. Epinephrine is another very, very potent and dangerous medication that you as EMTs can administer. That being said, it is a very life-saving drug that you as EMTs can administer. There's a lot of educators uh, for EMS that believe in the phrase that knowing when to give epinephrine and giving it effectively is the greatest chance a EMT has at saving a life on their own. So that means that this is 
the time where you might save a life outright. You know, you don't need any other help from a doctor. You don't need any other help from any other medical professional. This is your sole action will save a life. I'm living proof of this. I actually was given an award when I was an EMT um, for uh, saving a life of a two-year-old because I administered epinephrine because I was the only medical professional around when a patient presented with anaphylaxis. They actually walked into our firehouse with an allergic reaction. So this is something that can 100% save someone's life when needed. That being said, uh, it is also very potent and it's something that should not be given lightly. This is something that is rough on the body. So great when it's needed, but make sure that you know that it's needed. Because if it's not, it's something that we want to avoid putting in someone's body. So epinephrine falls under the sympathomimetic drug class. So remember back to albuterol and think about your sympathetic nervous system. Epinephrine works on several different levels of your sympathetic nervous system. The first thing that it does is it's a vasoconstrictor. So it will constrict your vasculature. It will raise your blood pressure because all your vasculature gets very tight, which this is very important because we're giving this in allergic reactions. And one of the big things that happens in allergic reactions is your vasculature dilates and it'll tank your blood pressure. We'll talk about this a lot in um, our allergies day, but uh, we give epinephrine to reverse that effect of the vasculature being dilated because it's a vasoconstrictor, so that will bring your blood pressure up. It's also a potent bronchodilator, so it will open up your uh, bronchioles. Same thing that albuterol does, this also works and it's arguably more effective at doing it. <clears throat> so those are the two big things that it does, it's a vasoconstrictor and bronchodilator. Some people have EpiPens prescribed to them if they have a history of anaphylaxis. Remember, we talked about the difference between allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a uh, form of shock, and the definition is it's an allergic reaction that affects two or more body systems. So that's a very life-threatening thing happening in the body, versus an allergic reaction is typically more localized. So if you are stung by a bee or you're bit by a mosquito, your body will have a localized allergic reaction to that area. That's why you see swelling and you might get some pain. You might get a little bit of a rash. But anaphylaxis, if you're stung by a bee that you're very allergic to, that's where you get multiple body systems involved. You have your um, vasculature dilating. You have your uh, lungs and the bronchioles inside the lungs constricting. Uh, you're going to have massive swelling to your body. You're going to have hives pop up. You have multiple different systems being affected all at once. So if you have a history of anaphylaxis, there's a good chance that you are prescribed an EpiPen already. EpiPens come in two doses. You have the adult and pediatric dose. So you'll have an adult EpiPen and a pediatric EpiPen. The adult dose is 0.3 milligrams. And your pediatric dose is 0.15 milligrams. So those are pre-dosed uh, right in their packages. And when you administer it, it will always give those doses. So something you have to ask when you arrive on scene, if they have an EpiPen, ask, have they taken it already? If they've taken it, find out when they took it. Usually Epi is a pretty quick acting drug. So if they took it over five minutes ago, it's probably already taken its effect. And so look at how the patient's doing. If the patient's still in severe distress, that's where we have to think about giving them another dose. But another dose at the EMT level is something you have to get medical control orders from before. So find out if they've taken it because that takes away your ability to give another one because we don't want to overdose them on epi. But keep in mind, sometimes they might need a second dose of epinephrine but that is a medical control order. So that's something you have to ask permission to give. And we want to ask permission to give this just because it's so rough on the body that we want to have a second set of eyes or ears since you're going to be talking on the phone on this patient. 
So your indications, and like I said, we're going to talk about this a lot more in our, uh, in our allergic reaction day. But we're looking for anaphylaxis with severe symptoms. Severe symptoms are profound hypotension. So blood pressure that's below 90 systolic. You're looking for someone with significant respiratory distress. You hear strider coming out of their lung sounds because you, you have such a uh, swelling in the airway that it's becoming an obstruction of the airway. You're looking for someone who can't get much air in and out. You're looking for people who are in significant severe distress. Anything, anyone who's not in significant severe distress, we try to hang out and let ALS come who can administer less potent medications like IV Benadryl to see if that will reverse the symptoms. So keep that in mind that it has to be severe, but don't withhold epi from someone who needs it. If you see someone who has significant respiratory distress or has significant hypotension, don't withhold happy from them. And again, we're going to talk about this a lot more later in the class. When you have someone with significant asthma and you've given all three albuterols and they're still going downhill, epinephrine is something that you can consider under medical control order. So you can consider asking for it from a, phys for, for, from a physician. This is because, again, it's a bronchodilator. That's one of the main reasons we give epinephrine. And so in asthma or COPD, uh, you, if you can't effectively open up the bronchioles with the albuterol, sometimes epi can help. It's a very rare circumstance that we're giving epi for asthma or COPD. So know that that order is something you can ask for if albuterol is ineffective, but it is something that very rarely happens. As far as how we administer it, we administer it intramuscularly. That means that we actually take a needle and we put it into the muscle and then we inject it through the needle uh, into the muscle. You might see intramuscular abbreviated IM. So IM means intramuscular. You also have to be aware that there's several different forms of epinephrine on the animals. We, we carry two different forms of epinephrine. We carry epinephrine, it's called 1 to 1,000, and we also carry epinephrine 1 to 10,000. Uh, that's referring to the concentration. So the 1 to 1,000 um, versus 1 to 10,000, the 1 in 10,000 is 10 times more diluted than the 1 to 1,000. So it's a very diluted form. That's the form that uh, paramedics can give directly through a vein in certain circumstances. So the ones that we care about administering is the epinephrine 1 to 1,000. Fortunately, in every place that I've ever worked or seen, the 1 to 1,000 is a vial of medication, and the 1 to 10,000 is a pre-filled syringe that you have to set up yourself, and it comes in a box. So it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two but you have to be aware of the differences. So just because it says epinephrine on it doesn't mean it's the correct epinephrine that we can give. So be aware of that. As far as contraindications go, some I have met people that say that they are allergic to epinephrine. Epinephrine is a naturally occurring hormone in your body. So no one is actually truly allergic to epinephrine. They might have a sensitive reaction to it. They might, um, and usually if you ask them, oh, you're allergic to epinephrine, what happens when you take it? Most people say, well, I get, um, my heart rate gets really fast, I get jittery, um, and my blood pressure goes up. Well, that's the intended effect of epinephrine. So if someone tells you that they're allergic to epinephrine, Ask them what happens. A lot of times, um, if you have someone who's allergic to a medication that you can give and you want to give them, ask them what happens when they're given that medication. Because a lot of people will, you know, if it's aspirin, which we'll talk about a little bit later, they'll say that they're allergic to aspirin because they get a little bit of an upset stomach when they take aspirin. Well, that's not anaphylaxis. That's not a true allergic reaction. That is a undesired side effect. So you have to take that into account when 
you're deciding if you're going to give the patient the medication or not. If it's a very mild side effect that they have, but that this medication might save their life, then give the medication. So take all that into account when someone tells you if they're abortion or anything. So as far as contraindications go, there aren't really any for epinephrine. For someone who truly, truly needs it, give it to them. Be aware it's very hard on the body. Uh, someone who has already has a very high heart rate, it's going to make that heart rate go even faster, but it's better than being dead. And that is the al alternative when you are not giving epi. If you are not going to give epi to someone who needs it, they will die. So keep that in mind that it is something that we should not withhold from our patients, but it's also something that's very rough on the body, so we only give it when we have to give it. Not something to be taken lightly. So I'm sure that at some point in your life, you've heard about the outrageous cost of EpiPens. And that's not inaccurate news. EpiPens usually cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So they are very convenient because they're easy to give um, and most lay people can give them. Some ambulance services still carry up with our EpiPens on their ambulances, but New York State recognizing the outrageous cost and it's very, very hard to equip every single vehicle in a fire department or every single ambulance with two EpiPens um, per vehicle that expire very quickly within, I believe, just a little over a year they expire. So it's very, very costly to maintain all those EpiPens on all the vehicles in the department, which was being a real financial burden. So New York State, uh, recently in the past several years, has come out with a program called Check and Inject. So this allows agencies to let their EMTs, if they are approved, um, give actual vial epi. So uh, you are actually going to be taking a needle and syringe and drawing out the medication from a vial and then administering it to the patient from that syringe. This is a hands-on part of the class. So we it's really hard for me to talk about the process of doing this. Um, the highlights of it, the syringe used for check and inject has two marks on it. The first mark is for your pediatric dose and the second mark is for your adult dose. So the doses remain the same as EpiPen doses. Your pediatric is 0.15 milligrams of epi and your adults is 0.3 milligrams of epi. But in terms of the syringe that you guys use, it's just marked pediatric and adult doses. So that being said, either for EpiPens or check and inject epi, what constitutes a patient as an adult versus a pediatric patient? When do we make that switch that they're getting the full 0.3 milligrams? So we'll talk about this several other times during the class, but the mark that we look for are signs of adolescence. So in males, the sign that we look for is underarm hair. So if the patient is a male and has underarm hair present, then they are getting the adult dose. For females, we look for breast bud development. So if your patient's a female and they have breast buds, then you're giving them the adult dose. If you don't find these in your male or female patients respectively, then they're getting the pediatric dose. And again, we're gonna talk about that a few more times in this class of um, reminding you what makes a patient pediatric versus adult. So even though it is much, much, much more cost effective to do the check and inject, the uh, all the supplies for check and inject costs maybe $2 versus several hundred. <laughs> um, it requires a lot more skill. Like I said, EpiPens are pretty foolproof. Most lay people can give them with very minimal training. The check and inject, you are withdrawing a medication with a syringe needle from a vial, and then you are manually administering it into the deltoid of a patient's arm. 
So a lot more steps involved, a lot more areas to screw up. So you have to be very, 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 very confident in your ability to do this correctly. Because if you do this incorrectly and say you don't administer the correct dose, say you withdraw the entire vial of epinephrine, which would be more than three times the adult dose of epinephrine is kept in that vial, you could do some serious damage to the patient. You, you could even kill the patient with from a epinephrine overdose. So don't take this stuff lightly. It is, like I said at the start of talking about epi, this is the single most common way that you can save a life just on your own. But it is also a very easy way where you can bring harm to your patient. So be, respect the medication, respect the routes of delivery, and respect your training level. If you do not feel 100% confident on any part of pharmacology, but especially things like epi, that's very potent, very dangerous, please train, train, train until you are very thoroughly comfortable with this stuff. So we'll just touch very briefly on oxygen. That's because we spent several days on oxygen administration and we'll have several more labs where we are going to be doing oxygen administration. So keep in mind, oxygen is considered a drug, even though it's free flowing in the air. The concentrated oxygen that we give is a drug. So when you administer it, you are administering a drug and you have to document an administration of a drug. So don't just give it to give it just because a patient says, oh, I need oxygen. Rely on your assessment ability and find out if they actually do need oxygen. You have to follow the indications for administration just like any other drug. You have to be indicated to use it. So. Like I said, we aren't going to go very deep into this because we already talked about this a lot with airway management and respiration artificial ventilation. So we revert back to the assessments we talked about with those days and the skills that we do resulted from those days. So again, just be aware it is a drug. We can't just throw it around like it's candy. You actually have to have an indication to use it just like any other drug. All right, so moving on into oral glucose. Oral glucose, when you boil it down, it is sugar. It is a way that we can orally administer sugar to a patient. We are giving this in cases of people that we suspect are hypoglycemic, so low blood sugars, to try to attempt to raise their blood sugar level. So in order to give this, you have to have a patient that has altered mentation. So they have to have some sort of not being alert and oriented. Uh, we want to attempt to confirm that the blood sugar level is low with a uh, glucometer, but that is not mandatory. That's not a hard and fast rule. You must do this because some agencies are not equipped with a glucometer. So if you have one, please try to use it before you give oral glucose. But if you do not have one, it is not mandatory that you get a reading before you give this. So if they have a history of diabetes and they have altered mentation, then we are thinking oral glucose. The only contraindication to oral glucose is people who cannot swallow or follow the command to swallow. And the reason behind this is oral glucose is a pasty substance. It's kind of like frosting. And so if we squirt this into someone's mouth and they can't swallow, it can then become an airway obstruction if they can't properly get it past their airway structures and then into their esophagus. So if they can't swallow, then they are too far gone in, to give this and they're going to need advanced life support intervention. Keep in mind, it's pretty slow acting. It has to be metabolized, so it has to be digested and put into your bloodstream in order for your blood glucose levels to go up. So it's going to take 5, 10, 15 minutes for it to actually work. So just because you don't see any improvement right away doesn't mean that it's not doing its job. So keep that in mind, it does take a while to actually work because it has to metabolize fully in your body. So the dose is one package, and one package is 15 grams of sugar. So keep that in mind that that's your dose. 
when you're giving it, attempt to get it like in the cheeks and next to the gums because then some of the sugar can absorb uh, transdermally into the body. So try to do that. Have the patient hold it in, in between the cheeks and, uh, and their gums, sometimes a little under their tongue. Make sure the patient can follow commands to do that before you do that, though. And then have them swallow it <clears throat> to absorb the rest of it. So when you give it, keep in mind that you might need more than one dose. Use that knowledge in conjunction with the knowledge that takes a while for it to work. So if it has been 10 or 15 minutes and you don't see any rise in blood sugar, then give a second dose. Always reassess your patient. That's a golden rule for any medication administration. And keep in mind, it does work, but it does also wear off. Your body is going to use the sugar for normal body functions. So just because you get the blood sugar up temporarily doesn't mean it's going to stay up because your body is going to start to use that sugar that's in your body, especially if it hasn't had enough to function properly for a little while. So when we give it and we get the blood sugar up, that's when we have to have the patient uh, manually eat other foods. And we look for foods that are high in sugar levels and high in carbon, carbon, carbohydrates, excuse me, because the carbohydrates are complex sugars that are going to break down over time, which means they last a lot longer. They don't just spike up and then spike down like sugar does. If you think of a sugar high when you eat ice cream or you eat candy, uh, sugar high spikes up really fast, but then comes down really slow. But if you eat a full meal, especially one that has a lot of carbohydrates in it, like pasta, you are filled and maintained for a very long time. So once we get the sugar up, try to have the patient eat food that they have at their own house. Um, one of my favorites is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because peanut butter is very high in carbohydrates. Uh, and then the jelly in a peanut butter jelly is very high in sugar. So having those that um, come into them, and then the bread also has a lot of carbohydrates in it. That will usually sustain them for quite some time so they can get their bearings about them and get back to their normal activities. We'll talk about this a lot more in endocrine emergencies. So moving on into aspirin. Aspirin's drug class is it's a anticoagulant, which means it goes against coagulating of blood. So it makes the platelets not want to stick together as well. So we are giving this for people with chest pain. And our thought behind this is if you're having chest pain due to a blood clot in your coronary arteries, now think back to what we were talking about with nitroglycerin. If it's due to the blood clot, we don't want the blood clot getting bigger. So we don't want more platelets sticking to that blood clot. So we give aspirin to make your platelets less sticky to each other so that they won't coagulate and make that blood clot bigger. So we are trying to not add to the damage. Um, it doesn't fix the damage, but we're trying to not make it worse. As far as giving it, we give it orally. Uh, we usually use baby aspirin which are chewable aspirin, which absorb a whole lot faster into the bloodstream because it's chewed down versus a pill that has to be di digested and the stomach acid has to wear that pill down. So our dose is 324 milligrams and we use it or we give it with four baby aspirins, which one, our single baby aspirin pill is 41 milligrams. So we give them, or sorry, 81 milligrams. Uh, so we give them four of those. So four times 81 is 324 milligrams. You ask the patient to chew and swallow those pills. So they're giving PO or pro orally. It sometimes has analgesic effects. Analgesic means pain relief effects. So you might have a slight relief of pain. You might hear someone say that they need an aspirin for a headache. That's because aspirin does have some analgesic effects to it. Contraindications for aspirin, if they have an allergy, again, like I talked about a little bit earlier, whenever anyone says that they have an allergy to the medication you are about to give them, ask them what happens when they have um, that medication. What does the allergy actually produce? Because if it's something very, very minor, like, oh, well, I get a headache when I have aspirin, 
if they're having a true cardiac event, a headache is not something you're all too concerned about. If they say that, oh, I have a significant reaction, I um, can't breathe very well, or I start uh, profusely vomiting, then that's something that you might have to think about uh, twice before giving the patient the aspirin. So that's when it will actually be a full contraindication. Another contraindication is a active gastrointestinal bleed. So if you have someone who has like stomach ulcers that are bleeding, if we put an anticoagulant inside the body, that's going to make the bleeding even worse. And internal bleeding, as we know, is pretty darn hard to stop. So if you have someone who has an active bleed inside their GI system, which is the most common form of internal bleeding that we see that's not traumatic related, then we are not giving aspirin because that's going to make that bleed even worse. So what if the patient has already taken aspirin before you get there? That's something that dispatchers are trained to do nowadays is say, is there aspirin in the house and have the patient take the aspirin? So if you can confirm that they took baby aspirin and they chewed up four tablets and the aspirin's in date, then that counts as your administration of the aspirin. If there is any doubt that they had or did not get the correct dose or an effective dose, say the medication's been expired for a while, then go ahead and give your full dose of aspirin. If they've taken a partial dose, which happens a lot, say they only had two of the 81 milligram um, tablets chew, then finish out the dose, give the other two. But yeah, if there's any question that they did not get a full effective dose, go ahead and give your dose. You can ask any cardiologist out there, if someone's having a true cardiac event, they would rather that the patient has double the amount of aspirin on board than none. So that being said, don't purposely overdose your patient. Don't purposely give them a second dose after they've had, already had their first, but we would rather they have more than they need than not enough. So if there's a question that they did not get enough, that's when we will go ahead and give our full dose. Just because I said that doesn't mean that you can go out and say, oh, I, I don't trust anyone's aspirin, so the patient's always going to get mine afterwards just so I can give them medication. That's not what I'm saying this for. I'm saying this for the patient who has the three-year expired aspirin because they haven't had chest pain in so long. Or they have a pill that they took and then they threw up immediately after. So you don't think they actually got absorbed into their body. That's the patient I'm talking about. So keep that in mind. Moving on into naloxone, or the common name is Narcan. Narcan is another great opportunity for an EMT to save someone's life. So the drug class, it is a opiate antagonist. Kind of big words right there. So opiates are the drug class of pain relievers that are made from opium plants. So uh, they bind, opiates bind to opioid receptors and they produce several different effects. The most prominent one is pain relief, analgesia. So that's why they're very commonly used and they're also very, very addictive. A drug that is very widely available that is an opiate is heroin. Heroin is something that most or a lot of people will take. And the issues with heroin is it's not controlled by the FDA. And so you don't know how much you're getting in a certain dose. So that's why it's very, very, very easy to overdose on heroin because there's no control as to how much heroin comes in one baggie. And that's how they measure it is they get one baggie of heroin and they in inject one baggie or sometimes multiple baggies. So it being an opiate antagonist. If you think of antagonizing someone, you are bothering someone. So it being an opiate antagonist means that it is going to fight against opiates. It is, uh, in layman's terms, reverses the effects of opiates. So it does that. Um, its mechanism of action is attaching to the opioid receptors. 
So it will bump any opioid, such as heroin, off of the opioid receptors in your body, and it will attach to them, and it will not let the opioid attach to the receptor while it's in the body. So that will immediately reverse all the effects of the opioid because your receptors can't take the opioid anymore because naloxone is attached to them. So that's very good because it will have an immediate effect. Usually a properly given dose of Narcan will work within a minute. So that's the good part. The bad part, though, is you'll have a patient who is completely awake, alert, and oriented and suddenly doesn't have any opioids attached to their receptors anymore. So they're then thrown into immediate withdrawals, especially if they are someone who is addicted to opioids, which most people we give Narcan to are. So you go from being very high because you have a lot of opioids in your system attached to the receptors to having zero which will put people into immediate, very, very intense withdrawals, which is not pleasant to go through for the patient. And they respond by being very aggressive with us a lot of times, um, very agitated, uh, sometimes combative. So it's not something that's nice on the body uh, if you are someone who is addicted to opioids, but it is life-saving. Also bear in mind, Narcan doesn't just get rid of the opioid that's in the body. It just makes it so it can't attach to the receptor. So when the Narcan wears off, which it does, if the opioids are still in the system, they will, as soon as the Narcan wears off and releases from your receptors, they will bind right back to your receptors. And you're going to have someone become high again off of the opioids, which will then produce the effects that we were originally called for. So keep in mind that that's something that can happen just because a patient's okay doesn't mean that they're going to stay okay. This is why a lot of these patients we want to transport for further evaluation at the hospital so that if it does wear off, they can get another dose of Narcan. As far as administration, Narcan itself can be administered intravenously, IV, intramuscularly, IM, or intranasally. Or, which is IN. You guys, as the EMT basic, can only administer it intranasally. So you might see a paramedic administer it one of the other ways, but at the EMT basic level, you are only allowed to administer it intranasally. And we'll show you guys how to do intranasal administration in class. As far as your dose, Dose given for Narcan is two milligrams. Your indications, you're going to hear me say this several, several, several times throughout the class, but your indications for Narcan is altermentation with a suspected opiate overdose and, notice that, and respiratory depression, which means they have to have respiratory depression in order to give Narcan. So it says suspected opioid overdose. So what are some signs that we look for with suspected opioid overdose? We're going to talk about this a lot more with uh, poisoning. So we're going to revisit this again. But things we look for for opioid overdoses are pinpoint pupils. So very constricted, non-reactive to light pupils. That's one of the telltale signs. Altered mentation, any drug paraphernalia, around so if they have narc or if they have heroin baggies laying around if they are a known heroin user if they have we call them track marks but they are signs of several needle punctures in the arms in the veins so signs that they've been injecting substances uh, recently if they have syringes or needles hanging around those are all things that you take into context or if someone says they used heroin, which is very commonly, um, very commonly happens on calls, is a friend calls saying, yeah, we shot up heroin together and he went unconscious. So those are all signs that we look for to suspect opiate overdose. And then I said respiratory depression. So respiratory depression means that they are not effectively breathing. 
So anyone with ineffective ventilatory status or respiratory status. So if they have agonal respirations, if they have very, very slow respirations, very slow, I mean less than eight times a minute are they breathing. So th those are the things we look for for respiratory depression. They have to, they have to, have to, have to have respiratory depression to give Narcan. Just because they took heroin and they might be a little altered does not mean you're giving Narcan to them. Narcan is for respiratory depression. Think of Narcan as a drug to fix a respiratory problem, not a drug to fix a drug problem or an altered mental status problem. Narcan is a drug to fix a respiratory problem. Please do not go out there and just hear, oh, they took heroin? Here, have some Narcan. Only if they are not breathing effectively. Not the only time you're going to hear me say this in this class. As far as repeating your dose, you may repeat it every five minutes until the respiratory status improves. Again, you're looking for respiratory status improvement. I don't care if they're still unconscious. If they are breathing effectively, you are no longer giving Narcan. That being said, when we administer Narcan, you have to be ventilating the patient after you administer Narcan. You should be ventilating the patient before you administer Narcan because, again, we are only giving it if we have respiratory depression. So that means they are not effectively breathing on their own. If they aren't effectively breathing on their own, error management says we have to ventilate them. So they should already be ventilated. But after you give it, you have to then breathe it all the way into their lungs. You atomize it and you give it through their nose. You then have to breathe the medication so it gets down into their lungs and their uh, membranes to get actually into their body. So be aware that a lot of lay people have Narcan, whether that be uh, family or friends of the patient. They, Narcan is a very easily accessible drug nowadays. You can get it without a prescription. So they might give Narcan and then most commonly, police departments that arrive on scene before us give Narcan. Typically, lay people's Narcan are four milligram doses, which is twice the amount that we give. And typically, they give it several times. They don't know how to wait for five minutes. Police especially are notoriously bad for this. I've shown up on more than one call where police have given five of their Narcans in five minutes time. So if they have four milligram Narcans, they've given five of them, that patient has gotten 20 milligrams of Narcan in five minutes. So in the amount of time that they should have gotten two milligrams from us, they've gotten 20 from police. And they wonder why the patient's not responding to it. That's because they aren't being ventilated afterwards, so they're not pushing the medication in. It's just kind of pooling up their nose and going to be dripping out. So keep in mind that lay people and police might be giving Narcan before you get there. And sometimes it is very effective. If you see that patient is starting to slowly improve, don't give your own Narcan. Let them improve. You, know, you can ventilate them and let the medication get through their system and let them improve on their own. Better than us giving them even more Narcan. All right, so now we've talked about all the different drugs that we can give. We're gonna go into some more general, broad term things about drugs. So drugs have several different names. Uh, the drug's official name is its generic name. But each drug has at least three different names. They all have a chemical name, so that's the chemical composition of the drug. The generic name, which is its official name. And then it's brand name. So that's the name that is given by a manufacturer of the drug. For example, uh, drug for acid reflux, 
It's called omeprazole. Omeprazole is the generic name of the drug. And its brand name, that's a few different brands have it, but a brand name would be Prilosec. So I'm sure you've seen Prilosec OTC, given over the counter. That is a form of omeprazole. That's the brand name of omeprazole, which is the generic name. So each drug has at least three names because they might have different brand names depending on the different brands out there. So when you are giving a medication or you're talking to a patient about a medication, know the form of the medication. So there's several different forms that are out there. This is just a brief list. There are a few others out there. Uh, you have tablets, which are um, pills, which are compressed powders. So it's powder that's compressed into a um, pill form. You have liquids, uh, like children's Tylenol would be a liquid. You have gels. You have suspensions, cough medicines, oftentimes a suspension. You have fine powder. Uh, you have gases. Oxygen, for example, is a gas. of That's a medication. You have sublingual sprays. That's an example. That would be something like nitroglycerin. And then an important one is transdermal patches. So that is a patch that is on the skin and the medication is absorbed through the skin. This is something that's common to see with pain medication. Uh, a lot of times we'll see this in the elderly, especially people with cancer who are going through treatments, which is very painful. So they'll have um, patches of fentanyl or sometimes morphine, but usually fentanyl that they'll put on their body and it will release small amounts of fentanyl throughout the day so that they always have some pain relief coming at them. This can be a problem because some people forget that they have a patch on and they'll put another one on. And they'll put another one on and another one on and they might accidentally overdose themselves because they have so many of these transdermal patches on. So if you have an elderly person who you're suspecting of opiate overdose based off of your assessment of them, think that they might possibly have several transdermal patches on. So actually look at their body and see if they do. And if they do, take them off. Again, giving medications or assisting with patients' medications is a big responsibility. You can really cause harm when doing medications. You can cause a lot of good, but you can cause a lot of harm. That's why it's imperative that we know the medications, we know our indications, we know our contraindications, we know what's, go what's going to do in the body and everything, and that's how we can form good judgment. Going back to some review of our intro to EMS, we have online and offline medical direction. Offline med medical direction, that is your routine standing orders. That's where we are not talking to a doctor for permission for every time we want to do something. So those are our protocols, our standing orders. Versus online medical direction is when we're actually directly speaking to the doctor and we get an order from the doctor. Again, reviewing our communication documentation. When you get an order, repeat the order back so that there's no question that that is what was actually ordered. And if an order seems inappropriate for the patient, question the physician. Because again, you are ultimately responsible for administering that medication to the patient. And sometimes physicians don't know your scope of practice as an EMT basic. They're used to talking to paramedics and they're used to their scope of practice they are not used to the more limited scope that you have, but you have to be aware of the things that you can and cannot give. So if a patient, if a medical director asks you to administer a medication that you, it's not in your scope to give, so it's not something that we discussed today, then you have to remind them that that's not something that you are allowed to do. So, take a moment and think what would be the potential risks to the patient of each of the six rights were not checked prior to administration. So think back to those six rights of right patient, right time, right dose, right medication, right documentation, all that stuff. Um, 
So if you don't have one of those links intact, then that is not the correct medication to give the patient. Say if you don't have the right dose um, intact, then you might overdose the patient on a medication, which could cause serious harm, if not death to the patient. So your six rights are very, very important to remember. So going for some more routes of administration, you have oral, which is swallowed, so aspirin is oral, sublingual, which is dissolved under the tongue, or nitroglycerin is sublingual, you have inhaled, which is breathed into the lungs as tiny aerosol particles, typically nebulized, um, or sometimes oxygen, um, which is a gas substance. You have intranasal, which is sprayed into the nostrils and absorbed through the very thin mucosal membranes in the nostrils. You have intravenous, which is injected to a vein, which is something that you as EMTs are not allowed to do, but you might see that a lot with your paramedics. You have intramuscular, which is injection into a muscle, like epinephrine. You have subcutaneous, which is injected into your subcutaneous tissue, which is just under the skin. Again, not something that you as EMTs are going to do. You have intraosseous, which is injected into the bone marrow. That's something that you cannot do as an EMT, but you might see a paramedic do. And then something that is more of a way of the past, but still could technically be used is endotracheal, which is um, put directly into a tube that goes straight to your lungs. You remember intubation, that's with an endotracheal tube. Again, that's something that's kind of a way of the past, but you might, might see it happen nowadays. So here's a long word, pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics is the study of effects that medications have on the body. So that's a lot of what we have been discussing today is what are these medications doing on the body? How will this medication affect my patient specifically? So this is stuff that you have to keep in mind. This is what this whole class is about is pharmacodynamics. We could technically rename half this class pharmacodynamics. Again, whenever you do any intervention on a patient, especially medications, reassess them afterwards and document the reassessment, document the change that happened. Anytime that you give a medication, you should say this is the effect it had. It could have patient was unchanged from the medication. That it could be the answer or it could be pain got better or breathing got better or something got worse, but document the change that happened because of your intervention. Also, always document the rationale that you use to administer the patient or administer the medication to the patient. <clears throat> so say you gave aspirin, say administered 324 milligrams of aspirin orally due to patient complaining of chest pain um, with suspected cardiovascular compromise. Patient reported that pain went from a 8 out of 10 to a 6 out of 10 after administration. That'd be the proper documentation of a medication administration. So just real quick, we'll touch on some basics for patients' home medications. So a lot of medications are prescribed to several patients so you're going to start seeing this in the field is you'll see a lot of your patients will be prescribed medications such like level thyroxine or synthroid is one of the uh, brand names or you might have a patient that's on metoprolol or, or the presser which are is the same drug you're going to start to see patterns that a lot of patients are on the same drugs so start to learn what these drugs are, um, especially if you see ones that keep on popping up. You see, well, my past six out of 10 patients were all on Synthroid. What is Synthroid? So you can either um, look it up online or you can ask your patient, hey, what do you take this medication for? Some patients don't know, but some patients do. And they'll be glad to say, oh, I take Synthroid because I have hypothyroidism, which is a low producing thyroid gland. So then you can deduce that any patient from then on out that you see is on Synthroid 
probably has a thyroid problem. That being said, a lot of medications are prescribed for more than one condition, so that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, Synthroid happens to be a, you have to have low thyroid to be prescribed that. I don't know of any other circumstance where someone would be prescribed Synthroid. But it will provide a good, valuable insight into the patient's medical history, which becomes very important when you have patients who are unconscious and can't tell you their medical history. You'll get to a point where you'll know enough medications that they're unconscious and you can look through all their meds and be like, well, they're on this, 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 and this. So I'm suspecting that they have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, asthma. You know, you can go through a list of suspected medical history, which will help you treat the patient. For example, if you have an unconscious patient and they are on, they have glucagon at home, they have Humalog at home, uh, those are two medications that are only given for diabetes. So if they're unconscious and you see those two medications there, you can strongly suspect this might be a diabetic problem. So in terms of learning these medications, it will come with time. It comes with experience. And like I said, feel free when you're starting out, ask patients what their medications are for. A lot of them know and they'll be fine to tell you that they're on Lepressor for their high blood pressure or they're on Humalog for their diabetes. Uh, so ask them what they're for and you, you'll start to see a lot of trends. Also, one thing that might help you is when you're watching TV, if a medication f or comes on for a commercial, there's drug commercials all the time, pay attention to them. Find out what they're for. One of the um, easiest ways I find out new medications patients are on is from watching TV. What's being advertised? A lot of times blood thinners are ones that are being advertised. And there, a lot of patients will be put on this new medication and you'll be like, well, I just saw a commercial for warfarin and they kept on talking about uh, being a blood thinner. So warfarin is probably a blood thinner. So that will help you start to learn a lot of the medications because they are being advertised on television a lot. Also, be aware that patients might take medications that aren't theirs, especially if their family members prescribe that, especially if it's a pain medication. If it's a narcotic, a lot of people will take their family members' medications. So just because they aren't prescribed something doesn't mean it's not in their system, especially when they're not feeling well. Also, be aware that they're going, a lot of patients try to use home remedies. Uh, one of the common ones is smoking marijuana. Uh, which we'll get into that debate of if it's legal or illegal. But a lot of people do that as a home remedy, or some people use essential oils or herbs as home remedies. Uh, some people use hard and fast illegal drugs, such as heroin, to help relieve their pain. So be aware that just because things are prescribed to them doesn't mean that they don't have something in their system. All right, going into assisting in IV therapy. Again, this is more of a hands-on thing where we'll actually set these things up. But assisting in IV therapy is something that you can do to help your paramedic um, quite a bit. One disclaimer I'm going to say is a lot of paramedics have very specific ways that they like things done. So if you are in the field working with a paramedic, try to find out what they like before you assist with them. Or they might just say, I don't care, do whatever you want, and that's fine. Me personally, I typically like to set up my own IV stuff myself. I like to operate very independently, and that's just so I personally know where all my things are, so I'm not looking around to see where something was put. So that's me personally. I know plenty of paramedics that want the EMT to do it every single time, and they don't care how it's done. So learn your agencies, learn your paramedics, learn your partners, and that will go a long way in IV therapy assisting. So an IV is a pathway that we can give fluids and medications um, straight into the vein, which will take effect much quicker than a lot of other administration forms. Uh, we oftentimes use what's called a saline lock. So that is a small tube that has saline in it. We can lock it off 
and then we unlock it to get the medication, and then we relock it so that no fluid can go forward or backward in it. Fluids are usually administered um, via a traditional IV bag that will hang above the patient. It's usually gravity fed in EMS. When you're in the hospital, it's fed by a pump and it will flow fluids. And uh, if you, you put a medication into one of the ports, it will flow medication into the patient. Again, this is more of a visual and actually hands-on portion. So this goes over different parts of the IV fluid administration set. Uh, some big ports or big things to remember is you have a drip chamber, a flow regulator, and a drug port. So a drip chamber is at the very top and it's where we can actually see the bag dripping down. Flow regulator is usually a plastic uh, device that is over top of the tubing. It has a roller on it that you can move with your thumb. And if you roll it down, it will pinch off the flow because it compresses on the tubing. And if you roll up, it will open up the flow. And then a drug port is a port that we can put a syringe on and administer drugs into the tubing. So this goes over the steps of setting up an IV fluid administration set. Again, this is more easily done in person, and we did this in person with class. So real quick, right here is your drip chamber. So it's a bigger space that connects straight to your bag, and that's where we can see drips coming down. And you can see it's half filled. You want it about half filled, maybe a third filled. That way there's a space to actually see drips coming down, but there's not you're not running out of space in the bottom where there's too much air. Right down here is your flow regulator. So that's the plastic piece that's the flow regulator. Here's a closer look. You can see your thumb is on this little wheel. You push this down all the way to turn off the flow because it will compress the tube. And then you push it all the way up here to open up all the way. We call that wide open. And you can bring it anywhere in the middle to constrict the tube even more and that will slow down your flow so you can have a more precise flow rate. So moving on to some chapter review. So remember you may be able to administer internasal naloxone or encounter patients who have received it from a layperson. You may need to have permission from medical direction to administer or assist the patient with a medication. Follow your local protocols from New York State. There is a wide variety of medications that a patient may be taking. You will try to find out what medications a patient is taking when you take the sample history. These drugs may be identified by a variety of generic and trade names. Your main purpose in finding out what medications a patient is taking is to report this information to your medical director or hospital personnel. EMTs should understand the names, indications, contraindications, and side effects of medications that they intend to administer. EMTs must have appropriate authorization to give a drug and always must follow the six rights of medication administration. Remember that reassessment and documentation are important elements of medication administration. A patient is complaining of chest pain. Here's some nitroglycerin, says a family member. Give him that. What do you do? So remember, administration of nitroglycerin is something that's very dangerous to do. The number one thing that we need to figure out is, are they able to get it? Because your contraindication is a blood pressure. So you have to administer, or you have to assess your blood pressure prior to administration of nitroglycerin. Also do a, a full assessment. Find out, is this chest pain cardiac related chest pain? Find out if the medication that the family handed you is proper to give the patient. Is it in date? Does it look compromised at all? Um, find out if the, the nitroglycerin that you have on the ambulance is better than this one. So a lot of things go into, into that and a lot of things you have to keep in mind. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. A lot of information covered. And like I said, we kind of touched base on everything today. But 
this is all principles that we have to use for the rest of the class. So we will revisit a lot of this stuff, uh, especially when we talk about like respiratory emergencies. We're going to revisit albuterol and a little bit of epinephrine. But it's important that we know the general principles of pharmacology from here on out.